Welcome back to the Theology of the Buddy podcast, a podcast for Catholics who love tradition and want more of it. This is episode 59. My name is Chris, and I am joined today by my youthful co-hosts, Micah and Brooke, and today we are answering your questions. Today is our Q&A episode, uh, and let's, uh, let's have a little fun, shall we? I think I'm too old for fun. Mm. When you say youthful co-hosts, some are more youthful than others. <laughs> well, all I want to do is have some fun, and I got a feeling I'm not the only one. You are, though. I don't want to have any fun. <laughs> you got my joke, though, right? <laughs> yes. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> You're the girl on the podcast. Girls just want to have fun. That's not the joke. All I want to do... Let's have some fun. I, I got a feeling <laughs> I'm not the only one. Why did I think that was girls just want to have fun? Wow. Well, because you're just that old, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know what the kids are listening to these days. <laughs> uh, guys, welcome back. Um, cheers. Cheers. Season's greetings. Um <laughs> Sorry, inside jokes. Um, the big news today is that Phase 2 is rolling out in Ontario, Canada. Praised be Jesus gracias. Christ. Oh my gosh. But it's only rolling out in certain areas. So London, St. Thomas. Woot, woot, we get it. Um, yeah, we're safe. Our friends. So I in, think they clarified that the church uh, rules apply everywhere. Yeah, even in Toronto. Yeah, so they've opened up to uh, houses of worship, places of public worship for thirty percent capacity. So mm -hmm. I'm kind of wondering if that means that everybody can at the Latin Mass can go to Mass because that parish can hold hundreds of people. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, there may be a lot of parishes, sadly, where that is enough room for everyone. Well, my question is, are they still going to do like, you know, a Saturday night mass and then two Sunday masses? Like, how, how are they going to execute that? I don't know. Yeah, who knows? We haven't heard yeah. from Bishop yet. I'm just but, curious. Uh, I wonder what's yeah. going to happen. Yeah, let's 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 see what uh, Father Comiskey and his cohorts decide to tell our good bishop. So, yeah, mm. yeah. Anyway, so that's pretty great. So, and also mm -hmm. they've upped yeah. it to ten people can hang out now. So now we're all going to party, and that's just the way it's going to going to go. Mm -hmm. I hugged my mom for the first time in like four months today. Wow. Mm -hmm. Poor mom. She and Evie gave her a hug too. Yeah. She she instigated a hug. Poor mom almost looked like she was gonna cry. Yeah. Yeah. It was cute. Then I yeah. gave my mom a hug outside. Mm -hmm. We also hung out cute. the yeah uh, the other week. Hey. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Yeah, we had a little backyard fire. Yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. Ate hot dogs, s'mores. We gotta do that more often. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it was good. It was fun. It was good. Yeah. It was good. It was fun. So, yeah. So, that's so that's big news for us. You know, everybody else down mm -hmm. in the States who's been going to Mass for a few weeks, uh, it's finally rolling up here. So, yeah. yeah we Our are. diocese has been one of the most restrictive, basically, in the world. So, for us, mm -hmm. we're finally seeing at least the potential. I mean, we haven't heard from the diocese yet. But yeah. I think with the government saying 30% capacity, they're going to be under a lot of pressure to at least open up to some yeah. degree. Yeah. I mean, I won't be the only one protesting inside the chancery if they decide <laughs> to just randomly stay closed. By protesting, you mean probably just standing outside and praying your rosary, right? Yes. Yep. That's how Catholics protest things. It's pretty crazy. Mm. We stand there and pray. Sometimes we sing. Sometimes we kneel down. Sometimes we sit. Well, yeah. Usually we pray, though. Speaking of protests, so 
this whole situation with George Floyd blew up this past week. Um, Mm -hmm. And we had one of our, uh, there was a, a person on Instagram. Her name is Brasil Lara Falsa on Instagram. And she had shared her struggle being a woman of color. And yet at the same time, not seeing a lot of talk from traditionalist priests um, about the whole situation. Mm -hmm. And she was kind of bothered by that. And I can kind of understand why, um, because things are blowing up around her and people aren't talking about it especially the people that she loves the most uh, so or trusts the most when it comes to uh, the teaching of the church. And so um, I started talking to her. She's fantastic. She's an amazing lady. Um, So shout out to her. But I wanted to, first of all, ask you guys. So this whole situation, what is, you know, we're going to do again. This is our 10 minute topics episode, uh, which is total ripoff. I'm going to say 11-minute topics. That's what we should call it. It's our 11-minute topic mm-hmm. episode. Even our track record, it's probably going to end up being one-hour topic. But <laughs> let's try our best. Okay, let's try. So, okay, 10 or 11-minute topic now, starts now. Yep. Black Lives Matter, systemic racism, this whole situation with George Floyd. What is your guys' hot take on it? Let's go. Um. So... Killing of George Floyd was terrible. I watched it. It was really upsetting and terrible. I totally understand why it blew up. And, you know, I'm not the most knowledgeable about um, how things are in the States or specifically about issues of racism. And yeah, um, admittedly, that's because it doesn't personally affect me very much. You can probably call that white privilege. Um, but, uh, I've been learning some stuff since this all happened, like, um, really important thing for me that I watched was this conversation between, uh, a bunch of black Christian apologists on YouTube. I sent you guys this video. It was, I think it was like the top Um, questions non-black Christians have about racism. There's these three Protestant preachers on YouTube. The one I follow is uh, What Do You Meme? He's a pretty funny guy. He does a lot of videos about atheism and stuff. Um, But yeah, um, there's a lot of legitimate grievances there. Like I understand why there's protests blowing up a lot of the time. Um, Of course, as a Catholic and as these guys too, as Christians, you got to say um, there's not an excuse for rioting and stealing and hurting innocent people. There's, I mean, that's objectively evil. So even if terrible crimes are done against your community, I mean, it doesn't justify doing something that's evil to, attempt to make things better. Um, but yeah, I totally understand, um, peaceful protests at least. Like I, uh, one of the things that was kind of poignant for me that they said was often people look back on the history in the U S and see things are fixed now. Like the laws largely aren't racist anymore. So what are you guys complaining about? You know, Um, a lot of people have probably heard this analogy before, but for me, it was new. Have you heard the monopoly analogy? This is like a way of thinking about, um, the effect of things like Jim Crow laws and stuff on the black community in the States. It's kind of like you have four people playing a game of monopoly and, um, Three white guys are like, okay, black guy, leave the room for a bit. And then they play Monopoly for a while. They play for a few hours or whatever. And then they're like, all right, our black friend can come back in and play now. All the rules are fair. So everyone's got a fair shot to win the game. 
except he comes back in and uh, all the properties are already bought up and uh, everyone's got way more money than him. So he's got basically no chance to win. So I don't know, like I I felt like that gave me a better perspective on why there's some grievances and also why like people have different views on racism and how race might affect things even when people aren't personally and consciously being like, I don't like black people, for example, and like actively doing something against them or thinking they're better than them, which is really prim- primarily what racism is to me, like by definition, but like, I don't know, systemic racism is harder to pin down for me. And it has all these different factors going into it that I'm still trying to figure out. Yeah. What do you think? Yeah. I mean, so, so a couple of things. Um, so, so I was talking to Cynthia who runs uh beauty. So ancient, uh, she's a person of color as well. Fantastic person. If you don't follow beauty, so ancient, um, it's, it's a great Facebook page. Great. Uh, I think she's got, uh, an Instagram. Um, so check that out. But anyway, and like, she doesn't necessarily believe that systemic racism is the thing. Um, so I mean, again, I, and I said to this to her, you know, like I'm coming from the position of like a, a white guy in a technical, like, Technically, St. Thomas is a rural town in Ontario, you know, and like, I think I can count on one hand the number of, of people of color that were in my high school. Um, you know, and there was a, it was yeah, a school of like 600 people at the time. Mm-hmm. Right. And, uh, so like where I'm from, there, there just really wasn't that. Um, representation and uh, that that tide is changing uh, in like our area now, but yeah, I I don't know. Like I've I've been listening to, and I think I've been so cautious to speak about it, um, mm-hmm. because I'm like not because I'm afraid, but because. Um, I feel I don't have really the, the place to speak about these things, um, because I've got no, I've got, really got no experience with it. You know, I'm not a, I'm not a person of color, you know, but I know like, for example, you know, I, you know, I've got friends who are and like, I love them and we're good friends. So what do you think about um person of color versus black person cuz i follow um zuby on twitter which it's like one of the hottest most controversial conservative twitter guys but he's all about like he's a, a black guy from the uk and he's all about like saying person of color is dumb just like say what color i am cuz i'm black <laughs> like I don't know. Um, sorry, it's a dumb digression. No, I just thought it, about- it. No, it's fine. It's fine. <laughs> like, and and again, like I'm saying these a things, and people- I'm like, I don't know if I'm saying the right thing or not. And like, yeah, one of the things that has happened from this whole experience, at least for me personally, is going essentially like I don't know what to say because I'm. Aff- like, I guess I am afraid in a way of offending one side or the other. And so, you know, I keep my mouth shut. I, I believe wholeheartedly that police brutality needs to end 120 million percent. Um, no, that doesn't mean we need to be spray painting F the cops on our buildings and disbanding our police services. No way. Like we've been calling nine one one forever. And now suddenly we're like, Oh, I'm afraid you're going to hurt me now. Like, really? 
really? Like, no, we, we have generally had, you see that video of, you see that video of the, uh, protesters, uh, well, it was a bunch of teenagers in the States, like throwing stuff at cars and suddenly a van pulls over and a guy gets out and immediately you can hear them on the video, like someone call the cops. Yeah. <laughs> I thought it was the funniest thing. <laughs> They're literally like F the police <laughs> like yeah. throwing stuff at cars. As soon as someone turns around to be like, you threw stuff in my van. I'm going to punch you. Yeah. They're like, no, call the cops. <laughs> <laughs> you know, oh, it's, it's unreal. And I mean, no, I, I'm not in the, um, the mindset that the protesters and the rioters are the same thing. They're not, you know? Yeah. Um, but I mean, the, the thing is like Antifa, definitely took the opportunity and ran with it as they tend to do. Um, and, uh, they've done some pretty bad things. Like I watched a video recently today, uh, of kids, uh, throwing rocks at a children's hospital, like get over it. Like, are you serious? That's, that's your response. You're nuts. But, but here's the, also the other struggle too that I have had and we're almost at 10 minutes. Um, maybe we're over 10. Uh Oh, but the, the whole question of black lives matter in terms of just the phraseology, black lives matter. Yeah. Obviously, you know, we can all agree yeah. that that is a thing, Hundred percent. but black lives matter. TM is a legitimate movement. And um, their tenets as a movement are absolutely fundamentally opposed to what it means for us to be Catholic. And so for us to even wave the banner of Black Lives Matter, I think is problematic because it's, it's the slogan of a movement, a movement whose whole purpose is, well, one of their main purposes is to see the destruction of the nuclear family to push for LGBTQ blah, blah, blah rights. Um, and it's, again, it's fundamentally opposed uh, to the Catholic faith. Yeah. Tied to abortion and Planned Parenthood and stuff too. Mm -hmm. You know, like even that was something I was um, happy to see on the discussion of these uh, Protestant preachers that I watched where even they were like, yeah, Black Lives Matter, the slogan, it's good. Like, people need to know it's not saying only Black Lives Matter. It's saying Black Lives Matter, too. That all makes sense. I'm with you. And But the word they used was um, heinous for the organization. And I was like, yep. Like, um, as Christians, we can't support what this organization stands for. We can't support the destruction of the human family the erasure of fathers and mothers and what it means to actually be a human family. It's just wrong. Um, yeah, that's all there is to it. Yeah. Yeah. And our friend, um, Anthony Stein from return to tradition was talking about this on one of his recent podcasts too, about, you know, um, there are some legitimate documentation of, uh, like this is the, this is their end goal essentially, um, is to see the destruction of the family because, you know, it's fundamentally opposed to their principles. So anyway, uh, I mean, again, we all agree every single human person has inherent dignity and is worthy of defense from the moment of conception to natural death, you know, black, yellow, white, whatever color you are, you are worthy of uh, love and dignity and all of that because God created you, created you in his own image and likeness. But again, supporting the black lives matter movement TM, not a good idea. And uh, I think it's important to make that distinction because words are important. So, yeah. and in a world words of nominalism, yeah. In a world of nominalism, I think it's really important to, 
be clear about our terms. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So now that Brooke's gone again, geez. Um, Silly baby. Yeah. So the, that was the first question that came from our friend Eugene.se was, should Catholics support the BLM organization? The answer to that, no. Mm. Should right. we try to learn about racism and make a difference or support people who are experiencing prejudice in any way? Yes. There you go. <laughs> now, maybe we can make a, a quick jaunt. Do you think that participating in the protests is a good idea? Um, it's a tough one. Like, I don't think I would. I mean, depending on where you are, it can be really dangerous. Um, not so much up here in Canada. I'm not sure I would panic over the COVID risk, but maybe some people would. Other than those considerations, I mean, I think participating in a peaceful protest is acceptable. Um, you know, there is definitely a potential for scandal in these current ones, though, which, I mean, I would, I would lean towards um, being cautious and not causing scandal, especially when what's going on has been so destructive. I understand the, like, I empathize with people who are protesting because it's a serious issue and, like, the murder of George Floyd was really terrible. And I think it's, under normal circumstances, worthy of being protested. What do you think? I agree. Um, I mean, I think, yeah, you know, the th there is that 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 concern for causing that scandal, right? Because you're marching side by side with people who are not just pushing for, um, they're not pushing for the same exact thing that you are. And, um, where, you know, say for example, you're walking through the march, you're walking in the march for life. You know, for a fact that the person beside you is marching to end abortion, you know, um, they're not marching because they want uh, some other thing, you know, uh, they are marching for the end of abortion. But when you're walking in a BLM event, there are those who are also marching for LGBTQ rights for the black community. And you can see this in the crowd. There are people with signs that are painted rainbow color. Um, there are, um, you know, those who are fighting for, again, the BLM tenants and principles. So yeah, I, I think it is a, a cause, a potential cause for scandal. I think we as Catholics can do better and we should do better and we should be at the forefront of defending those lives and defending against racism. But, um, I don't think that we should be doing it side by side with people who do not even understand what it means to um, to have I mean, fundamental human, human really, dignity. To extend the metaphor you use, like imagine if the March for Life in every city it took place in was burning down businesses and assaulting people and just like causing mass chaos and attacking the police and stuff like that. Would you go to the March for Life if that was the case? I wouldn't. No. No, I could still be pro-life, but I would say, no, 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 this March for Life is over. Yeah. Like We need to do something else because I'm not being a part of that. Right. Right. But again, that's a bit of a caricature too, right? Because I mean, and, and this is kind of the line that's being touted is like, well, that's, that's the riots. They're separate from the, from the protests. And that's fair. Because, you know, a lot of these protests are peaceful and they're just walking down the street. Yeah, that's and fair. Making chance. But at the same time, 
there, there are also those who are pushing for other things. And that's part of the problem, I think. And I think Julie really worded that well earlier today. She said, if you were to go to uh, a number of protesters at a BLM march, what would be, if you ask them, what are you marching for? You would get a different answer from every single person. They're not marching for one specific goal, right? They're not marching specifically for police reform or, um, or for uh, equal job opportunities for black people or whatever it be. It's a multitude of answers. And, you know, again, the question becomes, okay, fine. So these people don't know what they're marching for. What does Black Lives Matter stand for? You go to their website and you find that answer. And that answer is fundamentally opposed to the Catholic faith. So, you know. Yeah. Cool. Well, uh, that was a good 23-minute answer to that. yeah, and Brooke, Brooke left us, right? Brooke left us. So, uh, yeah, I blame her 100%. Yeah. Well, welcome back, Brooke. Thanks for joining us. We're glad Thank you're you. here. So, Thank you. So, now that we've answered a hard one, uh, let's answer an easy one. So, Buck Boston from Instagram asks So, she says that she likes how you met stories. How did you meet your spouse? Guitar mass. <laughs> Can you tell? <laughs> nice. That's not a joke. It's the truth. <laughs> uh, you know, our, uh, our parents went to the same parish. So we grew up going to the same parish and we were both in the choir. Mm-hmm. Life team. Yep. Chris Bray. Uh-huh. Yeah, Chris Bray. Yep. But, uh, yeah. And my mom always got you, your name, mixed up with uh, someone else. So she'd always say, oh, so-and-so was used, was uh, looking at you. I'd be like, do you mean the so-and-so? And she'd be like, no, no. No, no, this guy. Let's call him Jack. Jack was always looking at you. She would always say Ian. Yeah, she'd always say Ian because she thought Mike's name was Ian and Ian's name was Mike. Yeah. Mm. And uh, yeah, Mike thought I looked pretty cute wearing my poncho and bandana to guitar mask. Like, dang, she's got style. <laughs> None of this is made up. All of it is accurate. Yeah. But it, it, our, our paths cross back farther than that. We went to the same place for swimming lessons when we were kids. That's true. Yeah. And your mom would always see us and think we were so cute. Yeah. I didn't know that. Anyway, guys, that's amazing. So we go way back. I don't remember that, but our parents remember taking us (laughs) swimming as kids to the same pool. Yeah. And (laughs) um, anyway, so we didn't talk. For a while, because there was a little bit of an age gap. Not significant now, but back then, I guess it was. Yeah. And, uh, it was a big deal in high school. Yeah. Cause I was still <laughs> grade eight. You were grade 11. So, you. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> but then when I was going into university, like that summer, you sent me a video of uh, Buffy the Vampire Slayer, like clipped together with twilight and she was fighting edward cullen and uh we just it's a pretty uh, funny video it was pretty funny it yeah. was very well done yeah and uh after that our uh romance blossomed pretty gross <laughs> such a terrible story <laughs> <laughs> to be fair you you saw potential in me okay so traditional catholics if you're paying attention here's the recipe to finding a good spouse guitar mass twilight um, theology of the body. Theology of the body. Yeah, <laughs> that was totally it, though, because I remember we, we were talking about something, and you were like, "Oh yeah, that kind of sounds like theology of the body." I'm like, "What? That's a thing." Yeah, 
Ah. Unironically, theology of the body, actually. Like when we were first dating, we were reading that book about... The um, love that satisfies. Yeah, about Pope Benedict's uh, encyclical. Yeah. But it was by Mr. Theology of the Body. And I don't mean JP2. Um, Christopher West. Chris West, yeah. That was a good book, honestly. It was a good book. The Love That Set Aside was good. Yeah. I think the Benedict 16 uh, source material was uh, way good. better. <laughs> so so that's there how you we go. Cool. Cool. How did you meet Julie, Chris? And how did I, you know she was the one? Are you going to share that? No, I'm not going to share, share that. that. No, I will not. Oh, come on. That's so funny. No, but um, at least uh, I, so I met Julie officially on a bus to a charismatic youth rally. That's the first time we met. Uh, And then we met again at youth group, at the same youth group that Mike and I went to uh, a few years later. And we joined the music ministry. I was there. Yeah, you were there. Uh, there. You didn't come to Life Teen, though, because you were the worst. And then, uh, yeah. And then, uh, officially, though, the the attraction grew over time, and um, it kind of was born out of uh, spending time in adoration together. Trads, that's a pro tip. Take your girl to Eucharistic Adoration if you uh, want to discern whether you're called to be with her or not. The end. Cool. Thanks for giving some real advice. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. So that's that question. Uh, we made up for a little bit of time. Okay. Next. Next question. Serious or fun? Serious. Okay. Got to alternate. Are Catholics obliged to support Israel? Asks the Catholic jester. Shout oh. out, buddy. We're uh, <laughs> he's a he's a great guy. We love the Catholic jester. Uh, depends on the context. Next question. <laughs> oh, you're I'm such a agree. chicken! <laughs> you're <laughs> such a chicken. <laughs> I'm not smart enough to understand all the politics. Of everything that's happening there, but um, I'd love I'd love to build a church there <laughs> and uh, help all those that are persecuted, help all the persecuted Christians, Catholics. I don't think we have a special obligation to support Israel more than other friendly nations. Yeah. Uh, what do you think? I'm in the same boat. I, but again, <laughs> we're not experts on what the church teaches with regards to this. So, uh, yeah, but I would say, yeah, we don't have any more of an obligation to, to aid them as, you know, any other country. Generally, I mean, Israel's being threatened by like terrorists and Islamist states um generally I favor supporting them against those threats just because they're a relatively free and friendly nation that's being threatened unjustly. Yeah. Yeah. We're morally we'd be morally obligated to assist them if we had the means, right? And they if they needed assistance. Yeah, if the attacks on them are unjust. Unjust. Yeah. Yeah truth okay that answers that question thanks catholic jester next okay siri you you want to alternate yeah okay because we got more serious questions than than funny but okay okay did you buck boston again asks did you watch the office after michael left thoughts 
I yes. have watched the entire series more than once, mul- multiple times, more than three times, way more than that. <laughs> I have watched so much of The Office; it's unbelievably health unhealthy. Well, the um, Office is like the go-to thing to put on in the background while doing something else, but basically makes, anything else. But I so. enjoy watching it every single time. So I'm just saying that's <laughs> what makes it possible to watch it so many times. Yeah, I did. I did continue watching, um, but I will say that it was not as good, but it still had some really heartfelt moments. So I do feel the writing uh, got kind of, I don't want to say lazy, but just not that strong. The comedy was just not that strong. Michael, the character Michael Scott carried so much of that series. And uh, I think they had a big return in the final season. Agreed. But, Agreed. Yeah, like after Michael left, big dip in quality, and then they finished strong mm-hmm. at the end. I related a lot more to certain things um, in the final seasons, like you know some of the marital issues that Jim and Pam had. Just exploring those relationships, because um, you know I'd watched it before I'd be married and after I'd be married, so I could empathize with the characters in a sense. Um, and then the final episode, like the, the series finale always kills me when Aaron meets her mom every single time I cry. Hmm. I thought that was an amazing way to end. Like that final episode was just fantastic. Mm-hmm. Oh, and Dwight's wedding. That was also fantastic. Michael comes back to be the best man. Yeah. The best yeah. dish <laughs> <laughs> It's like what a parent raises his kids and then they all marry each other. It's every parent's dream. <laughs> it's one of my favorite lines. I would yeah. say that season two and season three are pretty high up there. And then mm-hmm. yeah. I'd agree those are the best seasons. And yeah. then like so when it takes the dip after Michael leaves it does come up, but it does not come up close to season two or three. Even Agreed. the way it ended, it yep. didn't end the way that, like, it didn't end with the same punch that season two and three had. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I will say, like, the one-liners in that show, it has some of the best one-liners of any TV series I have ever seen. I would agree with that. Yeah, it's good. It's witty. It's yeah. very witty. They could never, ever, ever make a show like The Office ever again at this point, in, like our time. That's true, because they already made Parks and Rec. Yeah. Which is the closest thing to being the same show that you could ever do. <laughs> right? I love a Parks and Rec, too. I haven't watched all of it, so. Yeah. I think originally it was supposed to be a, a spin-off series of yeah. The Office. Yeah. I think they reference it. Like yeah. They reference something about the office in that show, yeah, yeah. but I, I couldn't tell you what. Okay, it's a great question. Thanks, Buck Boston. Thank you. Julie Pinniger asks, "What books do you recommend for spiritual reading or growth in the spiritual life?" Thanks, Julie. We miss you. Mm-hmm. By the miss way, special so special note from her. She says she misses everyone. Just for the record, she'll be back I in season twelve. Yeah. Anyway, <laughs> uh, I can go first because I'm reading a good book that I received a copy of from the former Theology of the Buddy podcasters, Matt and Aaron. Um, so this book is called Healing. I what the subtitle is. It's by Father Wolf, FSSP. And it's like... Uh, a slightly edited version of like his sermons collected into topics related to spiritual wounds and spiritual healing. Uh, it's really good. And I think you can get it for free yeah, on the internet somewhere because Matt um, got a bunch of copies of it printed. But that's what I'm reading. It's really good. Sweet. Brooke? I honestly don't do a whole lot of reading these days between taking care of the kids and, you know, doing everything else. Um, but, uh, yeah, I 
I will say that reading the journal of St. Padre Pio was a bit of an eye opener um, in terms of seeing into his into his life and the things that he had to deal with on his own. You know, a lot of people just picture him as this happy guy always saying, don't worry and everything's fine if you're with God, which is true. But he went through some serious dark nights. Um, and, uh, yeah, Mm -hmm. he had a lot to suffer. I'm, I personally just love meditating on the mysteries of the rosary. I wouldn't say that's spiritual reading, but that's my favorite. That's my favorite thing to do. Nice. Um, divine intimacy by father Gabriel of St. Mary Magdalene. Mm. Um, it follows, it has, it has daily reflections for each day, uh, follows the old calendar. Uh, you can get it through Baronius press. Um, it's awesome. It's just so good. Um, and it helps, especially if you are struggling in the area of mental prayer, it helps kind of give you something to focus on for your time of prayer. Um, and it's not overly long, so you can read it and just, spend some time chewing on it. Um, and it's not overly theological. Like it's not, you know, it doesn't get deep too deep into like heady philosophy or anything like that. Um, and yeah, so it's, it's really, really good. Um, so I would say divine intimacy and, uh, yeah. Okay. Julie Pinneriger asks, which podcast member do you miss the most? Really? Chris. Thanks, man. Ooh, Chris and Julie. Chris and Julie. I miss them most. That's a weak cop out. Excuse me. You gotta choose. I don't miss you. Well, yeah, we live together, but you gotta choose Chris (sighs) or Julie. I can't. <laughs> or Baby John. Or Aaron or Matt. Oh, that's a good answer. Baby John. <laughs> I miss Matt the most. Um, I miss everyone, though. Goodness great. I just want to feed everyone. That's it. That's it. Yeah. You need to have Aaron and Matt over. Yes. And play Euchre. Mm-hmm. You mm-hmm. can be on my team. Okay. I'm a good partner. Mediocre. At best. Okay. Next, next question. Favorite book of the Bible comes from Bill Dykstra, AKA the sword in the cloud. I I know what my answer is. Do you know? I know what your answer is. No, you don't. Okay. What is it? It's really boring. What is it? John, I think. Oh, I was wrong. John. What'd you think? I thought you were going to say revelation. If I was smarter, maybe it would be revelation. Too dumb. Same author. <laughs> yeah. No. Yeah. Yeah. Same authors. Uh, yeah, I get it. <laughs> I, get it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I always uh, enjoy reading Revelation, but I like I like the shorter books, like Ruth. I, oh, um, Sirach. That's one of my favorite books. Yeah. Yeah. That one has some amazing, amazing um, verses in it. Mm-hmm. Some of them are kind of funny, too. <laughs> nice. <laughs> nice. So, Chris? John is number one. My baby mm-hmm. is named after him. So, obviously, mm-hmm. Johannes. Secondly, though, I would definitely have to say Song of Songs. That one's good, too. Yeah. But mm-hmm. only only read in the context of, like, the spiritual theology of the church. Um, yeah. I thought you were going to say only if you read it in uh, Aaron Weiss's voice. <laughs> <laughs> Please catch for us the boxes in the vineyard. In the vineyard. The little foxes. Okay. Um, Omnibus of Errors asks, should baptism, first communion, and confirmation be granted to infants as the norm? 
and what are the best reasons for it and against it? I have an answer for this, but you go ahead, Mike. This is kind of a like a question I would like to research and give a good answer to, but uh, my off the top of my head, my instinct would be no in Latin rite because we have a legitimate tradition in the Latin rite, I think, of doing uh, communion and confirmation after the age of reason. Mm -hmm. I don't know if I know like the theological arguments of both sides, but I think there's legitimately legitimacy, legitimacy to the, both the Eastern and Western practice. And I think it, I'd be hesitant to discard our tradition and just do the Eastern one. That's just an instinct, though. Like, I, th I tend to think there's value in the traditions of the Latin rite. Brooke, your thoughts? Yeah. Again, I feel I'd need to, I'd need to research it further. Um, for us, we grew up with baptism, and then you would have first communion, and then. Um, first confirmation and reconciliation and then confirmation and confession and reconciliation. I mean, yeah. Yeah. And I think that order is not good. Mm -hmm. I think the norm of baptism, um, reconciliation, first communion confirmation was how it was. It was normally, unless you were an adult, it right? Changed pretty recently. Yeah, I, I do think we should step back a bit from the recent changes. Yeah, probably bring the the at least um, confession and holy communion together. Agreed. Maybe even confirmation at the age of reason. 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 Um, yeah. Yeah, and I don't quite know the origin of. The whole of the of the sacrament of confirmation and why we do it so late for like you do it when you're in grade eight here, right? Yeah, having it in grade eight is absolutely terrible because we've literally turned it into an elementary school graduation. Yeah, and that's even taught in our Catholic schools. It's part of the curriculum like, now. Here you go, confirmation, and you're an adult now. Yeah, it's like a rite of passage, but. Uh, Oh man, that's not right. So from our experience, you can I don't confirm know. a baby. It doesn't make you an adult. Yeah. I don't know if that's just what our experience of being, I don't, I wouldn't know how to like, what would be the true right or wrong. Okay. Enlighten us, Chris. <laughs> yeah. Well, no, oh, yes. I, like I, I don't, I don't propose to be an expert either. Um, but I'm sure you could see my, the wheels yes, turning. He does. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I, I honestly, though, my, my, my hot take is that it should be baptism, confirmation, and then Holy Communion. Um, and like preferably confession before Holy Communion, but, um, mm -hmm. but I think Pius the 10th really wanted it for younger, uh, the younger ages. So, uh, I'm, I'm okay with that. Um, yeah. Because what about for babies? Pardon? What about for babies? I I don't think that I don't think because I don't think the church had a tradition of that at least in the West. But again, like I said, I'm not an expert, so I don't really know. Um, I know that there is that um, in the in the East, right? They actually give Holy Communion at the time of baptism, like a very small piece of Holy Communion. Um, to the child and then, um, and then they don't actually have their first, like their next Holy Communion until years later. Um, mm -hmm. so I mean, I don't know necessarily how I feel about that. Um, I feel like the Eucharist is the crown of, uh, the sacraments of initiation. So, uh, not yeah. confirmation. Um, 
I so I think true. that I think the order needs to be restored uh, because confirmation is specifically the um, the sacrament of martyrdom. It's the, it, what prepares the soul for martyrdom. Uh, mm-hmm. So and from like mission, right? Mm-hmm. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah, and look at the young saints of the church, right? Uh, they all received. Uh, confirmation from the get go, right? And they were prepared to to die for Christ as young young children. You don't hear mm-hmm. about young martyrs like that anymore. I'm not saying that there's a connection, but maybe who knows? Um, I think it does help to prepare a soul for um, being able to to witness to Christ. I know, for example, even in my own life that. I had had a conversion experience and even still I found myself dealing with a lot of fear and trepidation when it came to sharing the faith. And it wasn't until my, my confirmation that I actually felt a sense of being more emboldened to share my faith with others. Um, so that's just yeah. kind of my experience. I do think we're all on the same page where, you know, those that are preparing to receive Holy Communion should have the sacrament of confession first. Right? I would. Uh, yeah, but. I don't know. I'm, yeah, I, I, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> I think if you're doing it at, like, post age of reason, mm-hmm. then confession should come first. Yeah. Yeah, yeah not, I, I see the logic of that. I yeah. wouldn't... Um, I wouldn't necessarily have anything negative to say about the Eastern practice of giving Holy Communion to a baby that can't. Yeah, I agree with that. Yeah, I agree with that. But they're also in the age of reason. So I think if you reach the age of reason and you're able to commit a mortal sin, you can't delay the sacrament of confession. That's That's insane. That's true. That makes total sense. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I hadn't really thought about that. Yeah, good, very good point. Cool. Yeah, what happens to the kids who like die between the age of seven and nine in our current society? Yeah, true. They're not allowed to confess. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And let's not let's not begin to talk about what they're teaching in the sex ed quote quote classes. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Well, Omnibus of Errors, thanks for sending us your question. You're great. Um, you know who you are. We know who you are. Um, so, Catholic Coaster asks, why does there seem to be so much animosity between the TLM and Novus Ordo people online? Mm. It's all the Novus Ordo people's fault. They're bad people. Mm-hmm. Just kidding. Catholic coaster. We love you. Um, big time, <laughs> big time, big time. Love. No. Um, it's a really important issue. It's a really emotional issue. It's a really hard issue to take any criticism on. And yet there's a lot of criticism to go around. Um, you know, like this is, um, perspective Novus Ordo people probably won't agree with, but I think what we went through when we were like in life teen and stuff, and we would hear about Latin mass and stuff. The first instinct is to be offended. How dare you love the mass? This is the best, you know, you're attacking everything I hold dear. And the instinct is to be defensive and like, and on the other end, people are like, I've discovered, you know, the riches of the church and tradition, and this is our patrimony and everything that a Catholic should have. And there's so much of uh, our Catholic tradition that's, you know, being mistreated in 
it's easy to get angry about issues like that, right? So I think on both sides, it's very easy to get emotional and it's hard to listen. I think another contributing thing is a lot of people that are on the TLM um, that attend the traditional Latin mass. That I thought you were going to say on the TLM spectrum. <laughs> <laughs> But let's be honest, a lot of people that are attending the traditional Latin Mass are people that either grew up with the Novus Ordo, attended it like every Sunday, they know how it is, discovered traditional Latin Mass, and that's what they go to because, again, like what Mike said, they've discovered something that they basically didn't even know existed. You know, I don't want to say they took the red pill, but they kind of did. A lot of things made sense. They were, they found beauty there. They found riches now. So there is a desire to share that with people. And some people communicate it, communicate very well. Some people can become a little aggressive or defensive. Um, and I think there's a lot of passion on both sides. Ultimately, I would hope it's all out of love for our Lord. Great. But, uh, you know. <laughs> Um, yeah, like what Mike, I agree with pretty much everything Mike said. There's a lot of heart on both sides and, you know, yeah, Chris. So again, Mike, you know, summed it up. There is a lot of emotion there. Um, a lot of visceral reactions, uh, mm -hmm. on both sides, um, I've been literally on both of those sides. Um, yeah. and, but I think one factor that plays a big part is the victimization of, of those who have been in the, um, in the Latin mass crowd. Uh, there's been a lot of maltreatment towards them from people within the hierarchy, uh, people like just regular, uh, Catholics who shame them for their traditional uh, values and uh, theology and liturgy. Uh, you know, uh, I mean, even even our own Holy Father has you know called trads rigid and all of that. So, you know, part of the problem is we're we're already a little sensitive, I think, and so that's why I think there's so much head butting, uh, that occurs online. Um, mm -hmm. I would also say a big factor, a big factor, uh, is that, and if you look at a lot of the, the people that cause that stir up crap online, young, young trads, um, and part of it, I would say is because they are immature, inexperienced, people who generally are men um, who are just trying to uh, get their footing in the world. And a lot of the time they're still trying to just figure themselves out. And uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I mean, it's, it's funny. It's funny. There's, there's like one triad who, uh, you know, recently was very young guy on on social media who was you know so hardcore about the uh the traditional latin mass within a week was disavowing the latin mass and was saying i'm going to go become orthodox because pope francis is nuts and then within a week later he was like you know what i've i'm deciding to go back eastern right you know <laughs> to become a uniate or uniate i don't know if that's the word um uniate um, so a lot of times I think there's a lot of immaturity too, that, that plays a factor. Um, but again, I think, I think it's multifaceted. A lot of times it's victim complex that, that yeah. plays a big part in that. I do sometimes, and this is a feel thing. This isn't necessarily something that's true is those that love the Latin mass 
generally have done a lot of reading on it. And sometimes they just like blast all these quotes out there. And sometimes they, it's kind of a situation where you do have to meet someone where they're at, (laughs) you know, you can throw all the church history at someone that you want, but if they don't, if that's not the right means to express something, then it might just go over their heads. This is an example. You know what I mean? Is it just mm-hmm. me? Yeah. No, I think that's a factor too. Times like it can be a lot. Like there's a lot of steps along the road of getting to that place, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And sometimes trads are so um, upset by the uh, bad things that have happened in the modern church that they find it really hard to meet people where they're at if it because you know it feels like accepting something evil happening to the church or implying that that's okay or like accepting some liturgical abuse or some you know element of modernism or something like that right and it feels like you know accepting a drop of poison that you know is wrong is wrong but you yeah if you're going to convince someone of everything you can't convince them of everything at once right and it's hard on the internet when you're debating and talking with people and you don't have a real relationship with them you can't just kind of accept them where you're at as your friend and, you know, slowly address things organically. It's more like, you know, I, I saw your tweet, you're a heretic, and here are your herity, heresies, and here are 53 articles about why you need to repent of these things and blah, blah, blah. It's just not effective yeah, some people I think would look at trads like Ron Swanson walking into a Home Depot and he's like I know more than you <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> like I'm holier than you get out of my way yeah you don't know what you're doing at Home Depot not yeah. all trads I like that no no I think there is a bit of a caricature, caricature but I think those caricatures are on either side of, of agreed right 100 percent um you Not can all, all nova sort of people are susan from the parish council either no. exactly some of them are chats <laughs> 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 memes solve everything right sometimes they make things worse who am i kidding <laughs> yeah i think i think one important distinction though is that like on either side I think there is that temptation for an us versus them mentality and it's easy to fall into that, to fall into the mentality of the camps and to say, you're right, I'm wrong or or vice versa. And um, like to point the finger and not be able to actually have a decent conversation with with somebody and um and i think the big um the big thing that we can do is um do what our lord did and simply invite to be invited the mass speaks for itself it it does it does and i think beauty is the biggest yeah. um like it's it's like what was it saint augustine that said just you know you don't need to defend the lion just let it out of the cage you know defends itself Mm -hmm. and i think that's kind of the case with the latin mass um is that if you have a good well-meaning uh good well-formed catholic when Mm -hmm. they walk into that parish and they see the smells and the bells like it'll start to click it may not click immediately but it'll 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 affect you well, when Lindsay of uh, 
Monterey Lady podcast walked into, you know, the parish that had the Latin mass and, and she heard everything and experienced that mass, she felt home. It was first time she felt like she was home in how long? The mass speaks for itself. Mm-hmm. Was that like that for you? Uh, I was in a slightly different mental state back then. <laughs> <laughs> it definitely didn't click right away. No, but it didn't take long. I will say that once we were going full time, it was like, no, this is right. This is the mass of the saints. This is the mass that St. Padre Pio like said. I love St. Padre Pio a lot. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I really kind of. do. I really do. He, it's it's like he gives me a phone call every now and then. And I'm just like, hey, I miss this guy. <laughs> cool. Okay. Yeah. Um, Buck Boston has also asked us to do an episode or at least to discuss why the Latin Mass. Um, I think we're going to do a separate episode of that. Um, we may even do maybe a summertime live stream about that because I think that'd be a lot, a lot of fun just to reconnect with everybody through the summer sometime. Um, sure. so mm-hmm. Buck Boston, you know, that's coming. We got you. Um, I have also reached out to our friend from the sword in the cloud podcast, uh, Bill Dykstra about this question and his answer is hopefully forthcoming and we'll, I'll attach it hopefully to the end of our comments here. So look forward to that because I think he has some valuable insight to share. Also, I have also asked another friend of mine if he would share some thoughts. Uh, we mentioned him at the beginning of Lent. Uh, he was the guy that went whole like gung ho into the uh, medieval fast. So shout out to Jacob. Um, Mm -hmm. He has some thoughts on this question as well. And he was sharing it with me last night and I went, dude, you should be answering this question better than us. So uh, hopefully we'll get his thoughts on this. Okay. So here's the question. It comes from our friend Belinda. This is a little bit of an older question, but big shout out to Belinda. We, we love you. Um, It's an older question, sir, but it checks out. (laughs) She asks, uh, wondering if we would ever do a podcast on the likelihood of the Orthodox Church and the Roman Catholic Church reuniting. Like a smirking. I'm just smiling smiling because it, like, I was just listening to um, Census Fidelium podcast on. Fourth Council of Constantinople. <laughs> so they have a great podcast, by the way, with, um, I forget the name of the professor, but he is like really steeped in church history and he goes through all the history around the various church councils. I think the series is um, History of the Councils. So they're going through in order every ecumenical council and yeah so here's my hot take the filioque controversy is not even a controversy it's a complete what's the word it's an excuse you know it's not the real reason for the schism it's all politics it's all, I want to be the emperor and the Pope appointed a new one, wah, 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 and stuff like that. You know, <laughs> like, it is bull. Like, <laughs> this, this schism is bull. It's terrible. Stop it. Hmm. That's my hot take. <laughs> <laughs> you heard it here first. The schism is bull. <laughs> <laughs> like the reasons for it are so unbelievably dumb it's like it's like just as dumb as the anglicans it makes no sense i i was amazed to learn more about how dumb it was it's just like all the stuff going on <laughs> around this council oh man so short answer yes I mean, here's the thing. 
it was really dumb. They should have come back multiple times. They, there have been multiple councils that tried to fix the issue. And every time it ended up later being repudiated by most of the East. Honestly, I wonder if... I, I really don't think there are legitimate reasons for the schism. They don't. I know I'm not the expert, but, like... I don't know, man. It's tough. <laughs> like, all the... If there are any Orthodox people listening, they probably hate me, but... Like, mm. Sorry, that's my position. <laughs> the Pope is the legitimate head of the church and you should submit to him at the end. And Go ahead, Joe. In my Go head, ahead. all I kind of picture is the Orthodox Church looking at uh I don't want to say the the fire that's everywhere and they're like now nah, I'm good. <laughs> oh wait. <laughs> I know it's tough. Like how can you reach out to the schismatics? at the time when the Catholic hierarchy and papacy is such a dumpster fire. I don't... I was really hesitant hard. on using that word, but yeah. Like... Uh, I, I, pr I pray that yeah, one day. See, <laughs> you know that guy with the, uh, the idols in the Vatican? Yeah, that's the Vicar of Christ. What do you think, Chris? Um, historically, I think it would have been easier to reunite. Yeah. I think today, I think we've got some big issues that they'd have to address in order to be able to do it. Uh, first and foremost being the question of divorce. Because in the Orthodox mm -hmm. Church, there is a, a way of allowing for divorce that we don't mm -hmm. we don't obviously recognize right and that's not something that they did back in the day like that was kind of reintroduced later on down the road um yeah so the eastern catholics had to deal with that too right mhm mm like when a lot of them um reunited with rome they still had that allowed could you elaborate just a little bit if you could just summarize that and 30 seconds, what that issue is? Um, well, like the, uh, the Orthodox have some sort of, again, I'm not an expert, but I believe from what I've read that they have some sort of like law of gradualism that leads to allow for um, divorced and remarried couples to uh, come and receive Holy Communion. Um, mm. and to be in communion with they the They actually allow, like, in this process, you even to be remarried in the church. It's not just, like, what Pope Francis is pushing with, like, we're not going to really say you're married, but we're going to pretend we can't judge and let you receive communion, blah, blah, blah. No, it's actually, like, in certain hard cases, like adultery and stuff like that, they will actually let you marry someone else hmm. in the church. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that would have to be that's problematic. Sure. Yeah. yeah. So how practical is it for a, you know, for an entire church with divorced and remarried people to suddenly have to be put through the canonical ringer in order to become part of the, the one true church? You know, who knows? It's, it's tough, but Eastern churches have done it. Mm -hmm. Certainly, but I. But again, that doesn't like, excuse the. When did the Eastern churches become established? Was it before the divorce thing was allowed? No, not all of them. No. There are some that came into the church with that divorce issue and had to get oh. solved. Wow. Yeah. Okay, I didn't know. I mean, obviously it doesn't excuse those Catholics that are divorced and remarried, you know, within the Catholic church as well, without a proper annulment under 
proper circumstances. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Like ones who are living in adultery. Yeah. 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 Obviously it's the opposite of condoning that. Yeah. 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 So, so yeah, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll throw it to hopefully if I can get Jake to send it to me, uh, his response to that, um, we'll, we'll get that, but we've got Bill Dykstra's coming hopefully. So, uh, if, if I get it by seven o'clock tomorrow before editing time, I'll, I'll drop it here. Hey, you buddies. Now I uh, assume Chris already gave me an introduction, so I'm going to get right down to it. The question being, will the Catholic church ever reunite with the Orthodox church? Now here's my answer. No. Now I'm going to tell you why I think that. First off, there's a problem with the question. The Catholic Church has within itself 24 autonomous churches sealed with the unity of the Roman Pontiff. When we talk about the Catholic Church, there is that diversity that we can observe, but we also can talk about it as a whole because of the role of the Pope. However, the Orthodox Church does not have a lateral hierarchy, one that is kind of equal in its cohesiveness. There is no governing authority aside from the patriarchs of autocephalous sees, most of whom are equal in their authority to one another. Some may say this is what the Patriarch of Constantinople is meant to remedy. However, this is not realized in the same way as a functioning pope. The individual sees they go out of union with each other. Most notably, this happened last year when the Patriarch of Moscow schismed from the Patriarch of Constantinople. So we're not talking about two kind of cohesive ideas that are lateral with each other. So let's maybe ask this question. Will the Catholic Church come into union with any Orthodox churches? To that, I would say most likely. My church, the Ukrainian Greek Catholic Church, came into union in 1598 at something called the Union of Brest. For the last 500 years, we have been celebrating the Divine Liturgy and we've been maintaining a Byzantine theological patrimony, yet recognizing the universality of the Petrine Office. More recently, in 2015, the Eretrian Catholic Church entered into full communion with Rome, though maintaining not a Byzantine, but an Alexandrian heritage. So this being a thing that happened in history and continues to, I would say, yes, other individual Orthodox churches will likely join Rome in the future. Now, if I'm going to give you more of an answer... I would say the reason for the disunion uh, is typically described as being theological in nature. Sometimes that truly is the case. However, it would be naive to think that it is exclusively so. Some churches may not uh, find it politically advantageous for union, as there are strong biases in the East against Western churches. Just remember, the fall of Constantinople happen happened during a time when Rome and the Greek church were in full union. As Byzantium was about to be overrun by the Turks, the overarching stance among Orthodox Christians was that they were better off under Muslim rule than Catholic Union. Anyways, that's my opinion. Maybe you think I'm dead wrong. Send all your hate mail to Chris at the Theology of the Buddy podcast. Thanks, Chris. Okay. So... I think that might bring us to the end, friends. Um, no more happy ones? No more silly questions. <laughs> no more happy ones? Uh, Brooke, what is, the, what is your favorite type of ice cream? Oh, oh. My favorite type of ice cream is, um, I really like Rocky Road. Is that the one? That's the one that has like the nuts and the chocolate and the marshmallows, right? Is that Heavenly Hash or Rocky Road? No, Heavenly Hash is just chocolate. Are you sure? I want the one that has the marshmallows in it. The Google. <laughs> That's the one I like the most. Well, there you go. There's your closing question. Wow. And uh, as a um, bonus, Brooke, we should all go to Marble Slab now. Not right now. You know what we like should do? You guys should come to Dorchester. We should go to Frozen Cow. Oh, yeah. yeah. They have good ice cream. Our uh, local ice cream shop is open now. Yeah. yeah. 
let's go. And the prices are are they're nice. way better than uh, Rebel Slab. And way and closer. The ice cream is great. I don't have to drive across the city to get it. It's romantic. It's right by the mill pond. Heavenly Hash has ice cream, marshmallow, chocolate chips, and chocolate covered almonds. The That's good Heavenly one. Hash. What's the difference between Rocky Road and Heavenly Hash? That's a question on Google. I'm ready. Both are ice cream with marshmallow and almonds. The difference seems to be Heavenly Hash also includes some type of chocolate and Rocky Road is chunkier with whole nuts and big globs of marshmallow. Rocky Road, all the way. Yeah. I do think the big pieces of nuts and marshmallow are key. I used to, whenever I went to Marble Slab, you know, back in the day, I used to get chocolate Swiss with gummy bears in it. That's blasphemous. That's so like, weird. They would like freeze up. And so you'd just be sitting there gnawing on a frozen gummy bear. That ain't right. With That's chocolate not right. ice cream. Nope. Don't like that. Nope. You not asked me up that. that night. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it wasn't based on your that ice cream. Before you got that ice cream. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Mm. I thought you only ordered it because you're having a panic attack. I was having a panic attack. But then I later learned you actually liked that. I did. <laughs> there you have it. Awesome. Well, now that we are getting our restrictions lifted just a bit, let's go for ice cream. And next week, maybe we can all hang out one last time for the podcast for season two and discuss what, Mike? We're going to discuss why the Nova Sordo is actually better. Just kidding. No, we're going to discuss. <laughs> should we call ourselves traditional Catholics or trads? Or should we call ourselves just Catholic or Orthodox Catholics or some such thing like that? Or just team orthodoxy just kidding good blog boom <laughs> so tune in for our final episode of season two and uh also next week this is the last push for 700 700 followers if we don't get it brooke i don't know what i'm gonna do with my beard throw it down to your toes i still think you need to like get some wax and curl it like curl your mustache. Like, how many followers are we at? We're at five fifty-seven. We've got to get one hundred and fifty in the next week. <laughs> Can we do it? Easy. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, we'll see. We'll see. If not, if not, only only the vi the vibs um, are. MVBs, whatever. Only, only the choicest of the buddies get to uh, get to see what's uh, what's happening with this beard. So, I was going to say, like, if you don't make it, like, you could just like shave off half and keep the other half on. I've done that before, though. I remember that. No, yeah, it was terrible. I won. It was terrible. I, I won Halloween that year at work. <laughs> <laughs> I did. I got. I got the actual award. Yeah, because yeah. I I went Best half dressed. man. I went half man, half woman. So an entire beard. <laughs> I even shared shaved my chest hair, like one side of it, just so I could get. It, it was gross. Can you shave your leg too? <laughs> I did. I did. And my arm. <laughs> like, and my arm. <laughs> it was grow an, back hairier than ever. Yeah, and it was an itchy few weeks. I'm not gonna lie. We just lost all of our followers. <laughs> <laughs> there they go. <laughs> cool. All right, Great. guys. Well, so, uh, yeah, we'll close out here. So, everybody, thanks for hanging out with us tonight. Thanks to everybody for your wonderful questions. We really appreciate you guys sending those in. Uh, so, mm -hmm. um, share. make sure you share 
uh, us with your friends and family. We would really appreciate it. Um, next week we'll be, uh, doing our shout outs and, um, our shout outs from the review section on iTunes and wherever. So please be sure to leave us reviews so that we can shout you out next week. If you're not subscribed, please make sure you're subscribed to us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter at theology of the buddy. Uh, and you can follow us on Stitcher, Spotify, Google play or Google podcasts, Apple podcasts, um, or wherever you listen to great podcasts also on YouTube. Yeah. So I think that's basically it. So next week we'll be talking about to tread or not to tread. So from all of us here in phase two land of Ontario, stay Stay tready or stay something else if the answer is no next week.